So I enjoyed that, but I enjoyed the choir and orchestra back there singing, My Hope is Jesus. Don't you love that song? Don't you love that truth, Our Hope is Jesus? And boy, during this day and age, during this time, we need to have a solid hope, all right, that's bigger than the news and the, quote, experts out there. And we have that hope, and his name is Jesus. If you don't know him, I'd be happy to introduce you to him. And uh, he's a wonderful Savior. If you have your Bibles, open to the book of 1 John, chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. This morning I was accused again of orchestrating the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not my fault. I've been blamed for a lot of things in life. Growing up with six brothers and sisters, a lot of things I was blamed for that were not my fault. For the record, Dad, for the record, not my fault. So I'm not surprised I was blamed for the COVID-19 pandemic. It was followed up with, look, Pastor Howell, just like you said, you wanted people to change seats, so you orchestrated this pandemic just to get them to move in the auditorium. <laughs> and look at y'all in different places all over the place. Well, what a blessing. What a blessing. First John chapter 5 tonight. Great to see you all here. Those who join us online, thank you again. Thank you for technology and what uh, we can still do. Looking forward, on a side note, to the virtual vacation Bible school. I think it's going to be a great, a great outreach time with that as well. So help us with that. Pass out some flyers. Of course, we'll have one here as well, and you're welcome. Please, and, and, and please bring your children here. Bring some friends with you. We're not going to run any extra buses, but a virtual vacation Bible school. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for technology, right? It truly is a blessing, all right? When I'm at the store, my wife can call me and remind me what I forgot, and so it's a blessing, blessing for the online and the live streaming as well. In 1 John chapter 5, we continue with our series in the book of 1 John. As you can tell, if you look at 1 John 5, we're almost done with the book of 1 John. Truth is, we could go back through it again and grab some new truths and new challenges for our lives. That's the beauty and the wonder of God's Word. You can read it, I can read it, and God can speak to us. I can read it as a 40-year-old, my daughter is a 6 or 7-year-old, and God can speak to both of us. That's the wonder and the power of God's Word. And here in 1 John chapter 5, we looked at last week, verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. One of the main purposes of the book of 1 John is to give us the confidence in our salvation. Right? We don't have a weak salvation. We don't have a vacillating salvation. It doesn't waffle back and forth. We have a strong salvation. Not because we're strong, but because He is strong. And Jesus, once we are saved, Jesus has saved us, we are always saved. We're kept by the power of His hand and His power, not by our power. That's the beauty of the power of the gospel. And one of the main purposes of 1 John is to give us that confidence. That's why he makes it really plain. These things have I written unto you. That's how we know that. All right, he tells us that. I like John because he makes things pretty plain for us. But tonight I'd like to direct us to those next two verses, verses 14 and 15. A tremendous truth in the life of a Christian, an often overlooked truth, an often neglected truth in the life of a Christian. Would you look with me in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, where the Bible says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him. Now pause there real quick. You probably looked ahead to see what the rest of the verse said. But here John says, I'm going to give you something that ought to bring confidence in your life because of the previous verse, because of your belief in the Son of God, because of your salvation, because of the name of Jesus. Now you can have some confidence in your life. But it's not open-ended confidence or boldness. This is not a self-help, do-good sermon. Those messages are out there. You'll find them sometimes on TV, though not at 8.30 on Fox 66. Right? We preach the truth from God's Word here at First Baptist Church. But those messages are out there, are they not? False teachers... You stand strong beyond the false teachers. We have it all over the place how you can do you and you be strong and you can handle it. You're a major. There's nothing you can't do if you don't put your mind to it. That's false. That's false. All right, I can't defy gravity. Well, we'll get an airplane and you can't. No, 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 no. Right? Let's just stop right there. Right? If I jump, I'm going to fall down. 
No matter how hard I think about it, no matter how much mind uh, uh, exercise I do, I'm not going to do it. It's not possible. I'm not going to jump and clear the First Baptist Church auditorium in one single leap. No matter how much I think about it, the truth is there are some things we can't do because we put our minds to it. Right? We have limits. And this is not the confidence that John is bringing to us tonight. There's a different confidence that John wants us to have, a very specific confidence. Look back in the verse, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. We get to pray, and God says he'll listen. We get to ask, and God says, I'll bend my ear to you. Not because you're a good person, but because I'm a good God. Because you believe in the name of the Son of God. Because you're my child, I will listen. Verse 15, and we know, and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Tonight, the Lord's help, I'd like to preach on this concept of prayer in the life of a Christian. Prayer in the life of a Christian, praying with confidence. Prayer, the most powerful tool for a Christian, and often the most neglected. The most powerful tool in our arsenal, prayer, to be able to come boldly to the throne of grace before the God of grace, and often the most neglected. How is your prayer life how was your prayer time today how was it was all of your prayer life consisting in before lunchtime how was your time seeking God's face today today not yesterday don't tell me about this last week. I'm talking about today. How did you spend time with God in prayer today? You say, well, pastor, I pray at night. You should. Good. You should pray at nighttime, right? Should we not pray at nighttime? Should we also not pray in the morning time? During the day? Is it that prayer is merely something that we are obligated to do one time a day? Or is prayer something more powerful and more pertinent in the life of a Christian? By our answer, I pray at nighttime, it shows our lack of belief and lack of and our improper view of prayer. To think that, 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 that what we do is just pray one time a day and therefore I'm now a good Christian. Or to think that God is now pleased with me because, listen, Lord, every night I spend time with you. We miss the power of the Almighty. If your prayer life were your only daily sustenance, would you be alive? If your prayer life were your only daily sustenance, would you still be alive? Prayer in the life of a Christian. Lord, I thank you for these verses. I thank you for this time. And Lord, I need your help. Lord, you've given us a privilege to pray. Or there's no way in the next few moments that I can completely discuss, talk about, and preach about prayer. Lord, there's a couple truths here from these verses that I think you'd like me to communicate. So Lord, please help me. But help us to listen to these truths and to receive them. Would your spirit touch us and change us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. In your name I ask, amen. Praying with confidence. I'm blessed with three wonderful children. They're not afraid to ask mom and dad for things. Those of you with children are probably have experienced the same phenomenon. They're not afraid to ask to stay up late past their bedtime. Not afraid of that. They're not afraid to ask if they can have dessert every night. We're a dessert house of the Howell House. And heaven forbid we almost miss it. They're not afraid to ask for a special treat. And you know what? It doesn't bother me. Does it bother you, parents? Does it bother you? Sure, you'll say, yes, it does sometimes. 
It does sometimes bother me, but, but I'm glad my kids can ask me for things. And, and the Bible tells us that God is okay with us speaking to Him and asking petitions of Him. Not only that, He desires us to. And these verses talk about the confidence that we have. I found some quotes on prayer I'd like to read to kind of stir our hearts in about prayer. Someone said this, Our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. The parts of our calling, the works of the Holy Spirit... And the defeats of the darkness will sometimes come in no other way than through furious, fervent, faith-filled, unceasing prayer. The reality is my prayers don't change God, but I'm convinced my prayer changes me. Praying boldly boots me out of the stale place of religious habit into authentic connection with God. Someone said this, Corey Tin Boom, imprisoned by the Nazis. She said this, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? That's a bottom shelf quote right there. That's, <laughs> you can't get around that. Is, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? I'm afraid often for Christians it ends up being a spare tire. I can't do anything else, so now I pray. There's no other options, so now I pray. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Charles Spurgeon said this, True prayer is neither, or is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. He went on to say, If you believe in prayer at all, expect God to hear you. If you do not expect, you will not have. God will not hear you unless you believe He will hear you. But if you believe He will, He will be as good as your faith. George Mueller, tremendous man of prayer. Story after story of the faith and prayers of George Mueller said this, Let no one profess to trust God and yet lay up for future wants. Otherwise, the Lord will first send him to the whore he has amassed before he can answer the prayer for more. Tonight, some simple questions as we look at prayer. And one main, prayer, one, one main question, how is your prayer life? Life, the sustenance of a Christian, how is it? Not how does it compare to your spouses or to your moms or to your brothers or to your friends or your classmate or to someone across the aisle, your Sunday school teacher, to the pastor or to a deacon, to a choir member, orchestra member, but how is your prayer life between you and the Almighty? If God were to come down tonight and give us an account of your prayer life, what would that accounting be? What kind of testimony would you have before the Almighty about your prayer life? You see, John goes from our salvation, the Apostle John goes right from our salvation, right into then the next step, the confidence that we have in prayer. He begins to build a case for what we can have as a Christian, or what we do have as a Christian. The first point tonight is that we have a confidence to approach. A confidence to approach because of our standing with God. Standing that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Not through any works which we have done. Not through our good works. Not through our righteousness. But because of His blood, we have a standing with God the Father. Because of that standing, John says, we now have a confidence all right, in Him that we can ask Him anything. There's a boldness there. Earlier in the, in the book, in chapter 3, he says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. That word confidence, very easy to understand. It means boldness, boldly. Throughout the New Testament, it's translated as confidence, boldly, plainly, and openly. Talking about this boldness in our approach toward God, I can ask God boldly. I don't have to cower I can ask him plainly, and I can ask him openly. Just on a note, remember this, you can't fool God. You can't trick God. You don't have to even try, and you shouldn't try when you pray, well, I'm going to ask this, then God will think I want this, and he'll give me this. Hello, God knows who you and I are way better than we do. You ever try to make a deal with God? A lot of Christians have. Lord, if you do this, if I get this job, then I will do this over here. Somehow the Lord won't see our heart. He doesn't know our motives. He doesn't know our motivations. 
Lord, if you help me win the lottery, I'll give you 20, 25%, Lord. Like somehow we can entice God with a good deal. <laughs> He's like, what is that? That's paper? You call that money? I've paved my streets with your gold. <laughs> we have confidence. You see, our boldness is directly related to our belief. Our boldness is directly related to our belief, to our faith. The faith that I have in God brings me to a point of boldness with God. Because of my faith in God, I can now approach His throne boldly, the Bible says. I don't have to cower. I don't have to whimper. I don't have to make sure. I say it just right. I love what that one person said. Often there's a confused prayers. Right? We don't always know how to pray or what to pray. But the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, helps us pray. You don't have to be worried that if I don't say it just right, God won't do it. All right, I'm going to mess it up. God is way bigger than you or me. He's way bigger than our thoughts. He said, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And by the way, my ways are not your ways. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so are my thoughts high above you. Basically, you can't figure him out. And we don't have to try. We get to trust. And boldly approach the throne. We have a confidence to approach. So when I'm driving down the road, I can boldly seek God's face. When I'm alone by myself at home in my select prayer time, I can boldly seek His face. If I'm in a jam, if I'm in a pickle, I can boldly seek His face. And what's amazing is the Bible is filled with all of those examples. The Bible is filled with... There were times that people were in a prayer closet, or Daniel, right? He went to by himself to pray. We see that. We see Jesus took himself apart to pray as well. We see those examples. We see times in the Bible, and I think of Nehemiah when he prayed, and he was about to talk to the king. He was nervous. It was a simple prayer, a quick prayer, and God still answered. We can always boldly approach the throne of grace, not because we're good, but because we have a good God and because of our faith in the Son of God. A confidence to approach. Other religions will teach you that you have to say things just right. You have to say it this way. Say this particular phrase, and if you say it enough times, boy, that's the magic key that unlocks the power of God. I like Peter. He had a quick little prayer. He was sinking in the water. You say, well, pastor, that wasn't really a prayer. It was a plea for help. Thank you. Thank you. And Jesus didn't say, well, Peter, you know, you didn't, you didn't quite get that just right. And Peter sinks. And, and Peter, you better really nail this. You're right. I've told you before how to pray. I've given you my motto prayer. No, no, no. Boom. The Lord helps them. Does prayer work in your life? The answer is yes. It absolutely does. Why does it work? Because God is at work in your life. I think back to the time when I was in an accident. I was 18 years old. Driving down Midland Road. My mom and I were driving. My mom was driving. I was in the passenger seat. Car came out from a bar there and hit the side right behind my door. We fishtailed once. Right there, this, right, right by the curve there at Midland Road. It's the right, right, right there in the corner, I believe, or right in that curve. Two lane, two lane. We swerved one time and then swerved back here. It's funny how some things in your mind lock, right? And, and that memory is just is as if it were yesterday, right? Swerved again, and this time in a, in a wider kind of fishtail swerve and, and back again. The third time we swung an even wider one, and it appeared that in my mind I remember thinking we're going to just kind of flip around right into a truck. I saw a truck coming right at us. A large truck had dualies and a horse trail on the back of it. I can still remember that truck. remember my mom praying right then, Simple prayer, Lord, help us. Right then. I mean, right then. Not a second passed. And our car was in a third space, right into a driveway right there. Does prayer work? You better believe it. I'm so glad that our God didn't say, hey, by the way, when you approach me, begin this way, because we didn't have time at that moment right there to pray that way. We have time to pray a simple prayer of help to God. We have a confidence to approach the throne of grace, a confidence, a boldness. Christian, you can approach God boldly. Lord, I need you. Lord, I know this is the 35th time I've talked to you today, but I know you're not tired of me yet. 
because I'm your child and you've said I can, I, can, I can come all the times I want to. The Bible word is importunity. I can ask and ask and ask. See, the, the God is not like us as parents. As parents, if one of my children asks me 35 times, I tell them to stop asking me. God says, keep on asking me. He's a lot better father than I am and than you are. Lord, I've asked you a hundred times a day, Lord, I really, we are, I'm praying for this, Lord, help me. Lord, can you guide me in this? And God says he, that he'll hear us. There's a confidence in our approach because of our faith. Do you have confidence in God? Sometimes we treat prayer like we're on a help call. Maybe you've made these phone calls before that something has broken in your house and you call the company. And after an, an inordinate amount of time, you finally get a real person. Hopefully they speak so you can understand them. And maybe you've been in these phone calls like I have been where the solution you want is not readily offered to you on the phone. You say, well, I need to speak to your supervisor. You say, well, Paul, just a moment, Mr. Howell, and you wait. Eventually someone else comes on the phone and they give you a less than satisfactory answer and you say, I need to speak to your supervisor. Well, I'm the highest person you can talk to. The response I got recently. And I said, well, no, you're probably not. Someone owns the company. I'd like to talk to them. There was no way on God's green earth I was getting through to the owner of the company. No way. No way. But they could definitely make the decision that I wanted, no doubt, right? You know, we don't have to go through an angel and a, and a secondary class angel and a third class angel to get to God. We can go right to the owner of the company with boldness. We don't even have to wait on hold. Praise God for that. Aren't you glad prayer is not an automated telephone system? Hear your options. Press one, two, three to repeat them. Press nine. Sorry, that's not a valid option. Goodbye. What? No, come back. Aren't you glad? Because of our faith, what John says, we have a confidence to approach. Do you approach confidently? Do you even approach? We can ask boldly and God will hear us. He gives us the right to speak to Him. We can ask boldly. We can ask believing. Can your God answer you, yes or no? I'll ask it again. Can your God, my God, can He answer us? Can He do the impossible? Oh, yes, yes. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. He can move mountains. He can raise the dead. He can stop the sun from setting. Yes, He can do the impossible. Does he still do the impossible? Yes. yes, he does. Every time a lost person is saved, that's the impossible. There is no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. If you never trusted Christ, I hope you trust him tonight. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Your God can answer you. My God can answer me. Have the faith of a child, a little girl, talking to her daddy when they went to Disney World. Daddy, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Please stop the rain. And then she promptly went to sleep. The dad could no more stop the rain than he could jump over a skyscraper. But the little girl didn't contemplate that fact. She just knew that her daddy could do anything. And she slept like a baby. Your God, my God, can do anything. What about that faith of a child? You see, my God can stop the rain. He does that when you wake him up from a nap. That's what our God does. Our God can do the impossible. We can ask believing. We serve a God who controls the weather, who can control the wind, and can control, can control everything. We have a confidence to approach because we can approach boldly and because we can ask in faith. Prayer is not just an exercise in verbiage. Prayer is not just an exercise in our words that we say. Prayer is communication with the creator of the universe. I'll remind you of the question again, how is your prayer life? How is it? How is it? Is it bold or is it weak? Lord, this is what I'm asking for. And sometimes as Christians, we tack on a little phrase. 
But Lord, if you do something different, Lord, if if it's not quite right, now God will do whatever he thinks is right. The Bible teaches us to ask in faith. There's a confidence to approach, but there's also here a confidence in the answers. Would you look again in in our passage, verses 14 to 15? And this is a confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, most of us don't have a problem with that verse in the sense of it being true in our life. We don't doubt that God hears us when we pray. We don't don't doubt that God listens to us when we pray. We we hopefully take advantage of it, but but that's not a problem. We may not pray like we ought to, how's your prayer life, but it's not because we don't believe God hears us. Verse 15 and cast those for a little loop sometimes. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So, well, Pastor, I prayed. I prayed for two years. And God never answered my prayer. What does he mean? That if we pray and he hears us, and if he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. We absolutely believe that God is not a magic genie. All right, God, we do not treat him like a genie where we rub the bottle and get three wishes, whatever we wish. We know that as a, as a fact, right? We know that if we pray for a Ferrari, God's not probably going to give us a Ferrari. No, we'd be pleased if he did, most likely. We, we, we understand that, but, but, but sometimes we get discouraged. Oh, well, God said no. But I look at this passage, and I don't see the negative uh, context. I see the positive context of what God is doing. That in a sense, he's saying that that he is always answering our petitions. But I'd submit this tonight. He answers our petitions, but he doesn't always answer them, all right, like we've asked them. Let's look at this tonight a little bit here. He says in verse number 14 that that we must ask according to his will. Uh Aha, I knew it. There's parameters. I knew there was a catch. Well, there's no catch. He's just teaching us about how to approach him according to his will. Well, how do we know the will of God? How do we find out the will of God? Well, there's a couple of key ways. First of all, uh, God tells us his will in his book. He'll say things like this, some real plain things, and this is the will of God. If you read that, know this, that's the will of God. You see how that works? It's not confusing. The will of God is what he says the will of God is. Well, we know that's the will of God, but we also find out in this book the mind of God, the things that God loves to do. You know what God loves to do? God loves to save people from their sin. From beginning to end, the plan of salvation in this book. You know that if you pray for lost souls, that's in the will of God. God loves to grow his people. He loves to grow his Christians. Lord, help so-and-so. Help me, Lord, I want to grow. You're like, well, pastor, sometimes I don't need saving or growing, I need money. Right? That's where it's at sometimes, isn't it? I don't need to grow as a Christian, I need $300 because I just, I just got my consumer's bill. Do I get to pray about that? Yes. Yes, you do. The Bible even speaks of that. There are times when, I got reminded when Peter... Um, and they had to pay taxes. Jesus had them go fishing. They caught a fish and the coin was in the mouth to pay. Well, look at that. God cares about money. You see, we can follow his word. He says in Matthew chapter 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things were added there? He's just talking about things, food and raiment, earthly things. That God cares about these things. I find his will by looking at his word, by following his word, and by relying on his spirit. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You say, I need money for my bill. My Bible says, I don't even know how to pray for what I ought to pray for. 
For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You say, but, but pastor, it's a bill. It's a big bill. And I say to you this, and, but, but God says His Spirit will help you pray how you ought to pray. God is not a piggy bank. We know this. It's not just because I give that God pays all my bills. I could get some bills that would not please God. I could go out tomorrow and buy a brand new truck. And it would be wrong if I said, well, Lord, you got to pay for it now. I, I tied this past Sunday, so pay for my brand new truck. God is under no obligation to pay for that truck now, is he? Now, could he pay for it? Well, of course he could. He could give me a truck and a Ferrari tonight. But we don't even know. The Bible says we often don't even know how we ought to pray for ourselves. I know how to pray for others and some things we ought to pray for. But in our personal battles, in our personal lives, we don't even know often how we, how we ought to pray. But the Holy Spirit helps us to pray inside of God's will. Are there examples for that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. I want to look at his answers very, very briefly tonight. Because sometimes we feel like God has just said no. And the fact is, sometimes he does. If I can talk just briefly, as a father to a child, when our children were young, they liked to grab things that they had no business touching. Some things like the crystal in the house, I didn't want them to touch. Some things like electrical outlets, I didn't want them to touch. And they would boldly approach those things which I did not want them to have or to touch. They would boldly approach the little walker, the electrical outlet, the little feet just kicking along, and reach for it. That's what I want. That's what I'm asking for. And I, as a terrible human father, said no. Or would I be terrible to say yes? Help me. Of course. Sometimes, as fleshly humans, we reach for those things which would destroy us. Not just hurt us, destroy us. And we reach for them boldly. And God, in His wisdom, says, My child, I have something else for you. But, but I, I want that shiny thing right there. No, that's a knife. And you're too. You will hurt yourself. The angel fetched Peter out of prison. But it was prayer that fetched the angel. We pray for a new heart. And we expect our answer. We expect our answer in the upspringing and operation within us of new desires. We look for spiritual grace by immediate and easy communications. And sometimes it comes under a course of prolonged and Afflictive discipline. You see, God answers prayer. The Bible tells us He does. Even if we don't see it, He answers them. Even if we don't understand it, He answers them. We understand from the Word that, that God seeks to give good, good gifts to His children. God desires His will to be done on earth. What is His will? Well, He desires all men to be saved. He, des he desires that you and I stand perfected before, his, before Him. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. That means some things he answers to make sure that I'm more like Jesus Christ. What a blessing. He's doing something that I cannot see. I look at his timing. God, in answering our prayers, gives himself a great latitude of time. Have you ever thought that God was late? I have. I'll tell you, I have. Martha did. Lord, you're late. Lazarus is dead. And Jesus says, no, I'm right on time. I'm right on time. I have felt that God's timing has been off. I've worried. I've taken on unnecessary worry in my life because God didn't provide the answer right when I began to pray. Now, the problem wasn't quite there yet. It was down the road a little bit. And I wanted the problem solved before we got there. I want the Lord to, to work quickly and, and efficiently and Lord, I'll help you plan early so here's a great solution, here's my problem and sooner you get this done, we can just move on in life. That's not what God was doing, right? Not in my life at least. Maybe God was increasing my faith. 
saying, will you trust me when it looks like I have failed you? Not when he has failed me, when it looks like I'm failing you. Lord, do you not understand what is going on? But God is gracious, God is good, and he's always on time. I see his timing, and I see his wisdom. Look at the Apostle Paul. You know the passage where Paul prayed for something for three times. Thrice I besought the Lord. Three times he asked God to remove a thorn in the flesh. Three times. If Paul couldn't get this done, why would we think we get it done? That's what we think. But listen, Paul has no more access to God than you or I have. We have the same access because I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. He's a child of God. Paul asked the Lord three times. Did God say no? Did he say no? Well, he kind of avoided the question, did he not? He didn't say no. He didn't say, Paul, no. He said, here's your yes. My grace is sufficient for you. He said yes with a greater yes. He said, I know what you're asking me, Paul. <laughs> You've asked me three times now, all right? I'm going to tell you yes, not to the removal, but yes to my grace. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul says, more, most gladly, therefore, will I rest in the power. My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Remember, when you pray, the love of God wants what's best for me. The wisdom of God knows what is best for me. And the power of God can accomplish what is best for me. When we pray, God loves us, and He knows, He wants, and can accomplish Christ never gives his children worse things than what they ask for. God never gives you something worse than what you ask for. He didn't say to Paul, Paul, you prayed for this thorn in the flesh to be removed. I'm going to give you two thorns. He said, I'm going to give you the greatest gift on earth, my grace. I'll give you my power. Someone said it this way. If the request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says, slow. If you are wrong, God says, grow. Sometimes God says, go. How's your prayer life? How is it today? A tale is told about a small town that had historically been dry. No alcohol in town. But then a local businessman decided to build a tavern a group of Christians from a local church were concerned and planned an all-night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene. It just so happened that shortly thereafter, lightning struck the bar and burned it straight to the ground. The owner of the bar sued the church, <laughs> claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible and the church hired a lawyer to argue in court that they were not responsible. The presiding judge after the initial review of the case, stated this. And this will get you. Listen. He said this, No matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear. The owner of the tavern believes in prayer and the Christians do not. How's your prayer life? This is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And we know that if He hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Lord, thank You that we can pray. Lord, what a privilege to pray. Lord, would You touch us tonight? Lord, would You help us to be honest? Heads bowed and eyes closed. How's your prayer life? Oh, not how it compares. How is it? Just a moment, the piano will begin to pray. We'll stand to our feet. If you do business with God, the altar will be open. What a privilege to pray. Are you a prayer warrior? Are you dying in your prayer life?
or is it full of life, fervor? Lord, help us to take advantage of this powerful, powerful privilege. In Jesus' name. As we stand to our feet, our heads bowed and eyes closed. If God spoke to you, the altar's open. Piano's playing a tremendous song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. here tonight and not sure that you have a home in heaven. You never trusted Christ. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. If you've joined us online, there'll be a number on your screen. You can call us. We'd love to talk to you and share from God's word how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died for you. By trusting him, you have a home in heaven. Would you contact us? Thank you for your wisdom. Lord, I'm so glad that you know what we need a whole lot better than we do. Lord, thank you for the privilege you've given to us. Lord, may we as a church, as Christians, be praying Christians in a praying church. Lord, there's so much that you want to do. We pray that you would use us to do it, Lord. But Lord, you've said that sometimes we don't have because we don't ask. Lord, may we be prayer warriors and praying Christians. Lord, thank you that you hear us. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.